Here we go. So welcome, everyone. Very happy to have this a new episode of the Secrets of Brands uh, webinar. And I'm super happy today to uh, welcome Lorena from Mattel to talk about uh, how to use technology to help you simplify. So PIM related tasks. We'll go into all the details of what is a PIM or, you know, the technology and how that helps actually uh, brands to grow and expand. But maybe uh, as we get started, uh, Lorena, could you give a few words about uh, yourself, who you are to the crowd? Sure. Hi. Thanks, Rob. I am Lorena. I've been working in Mattel for the last 12 years, and I used to be a key account manager for the first eight years of it, looking after accounts in, in Spain and, and region and Europe. And then I moved into digital marketing and then made it to the regional role for the team that looks after syndication and creation of product detail pages. So, so that's uh, me. <laughs> That's from you. So we could say you're an expert in in content, and that your your life uh, revolves around content and making sure content goes from what what is being created to the online space, right? Yes, that that you can say that at least uh, that I spend significant amount of my work life in making sure that our content reaches the touch points. Great. Awesome. And uh, so I'm Jerome. I'm the founder and the CEO of e-commerce. Who is e-commerce? We're an agency, uh, a full service Amazon agency. We use a 360 degrees approach with offices in the US, in Luxembourg, where our headquarters are, and in India, also in Madagascar. So really in Asia, Africa, Europe, and the uh, uh, the US or the Americas. You can see we have a lot of uh, different uh, uh, verticals in which we work and we work a lot on um, like content well, our 360 degrees goes from strategic consulting account management retail media so advertising and we also do retail and logistics because we have our our own account today we'll be talking about the part where we called uh strategic consulting whereas we help brands understand and navigate the, the technology also to grow and expand uh, their brands but let's uh, get started a, a bit in into our story, Lorena, and you'll help us understand what what is the PIM uh, actually? What 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 is it like? What the three letters? But beyond that, could you explain a bit what it is and what it means for brands? Sure. So PIM it's an acronym that refers to the systems that manage all the information around one product, helps them collect it in one in one place, and then also allows. To, to show one single view of a product, regardless where the information comes from. And then it also helps the company to share it with the different, uh, you know, either downstream systems or retailers. In, in my case, I, I specialize more in retailers, but yeah, that, that would be like a theme. And like there's uh, th there's a lot of in those world of, of tools there's a lot of acronyms because you've got dam systems with the digital assets you've got ERPs you've got PIMs and and the syndication parts can you explain from your perspective because there's a lot of different solutions out there but how does a bit the flow goes between those uh, different uh, pieces let's say so yes I guess every company must have their own um, ecosystem but yes for for Mattel we do have an ERP we do have a dam that is upstream to to our well to our partner to Salsify. So it's an upstream system. So once the assets are completely final in our dam, if they are meant to be implemented in e-commerce, they would flow into Salsify. And we also have another upstream legacy, you know, upstream system for copywriting, copywriting and translations. So all that would feed into our into our Salsify. PMX instance, and we would also collect information from that that we you know help manually to move from one place to another, like information, some pieces of information from quality, some other marketing information, etc. That we put manually into the system. So as much as you can automate, the better. But you know, probably you have to bridge some of it with manual effort. Okay, so if I understand well, you've got different feeds uh, coming into that PIM system, which sort of integrates everything and then sends it to the retailers, right? Yes. I mean, from there, we put together the different tactics depending on the retailers, that maturity that they have or their preferred way of receiving the information. We put together the necessary tactics to 
send it over to them. Okay. And if we sort of break down a bit the, the different process, so you've got all the upstream part. So we mm-hmm. you were talking about uh, one where you have all the... Um, the like, images, the copies, yeah. et cetera. The, da- the damsing or the digital asset part. And then you've got a part where you have some, maybe some extra copywriting or translations or other things uh, you added. What are the typical issues or what are the things you need to be uh, careful about when you're looking at this upstream uh, flow? Uh, yeah, I would say that for us, it can be sometimes uh, we need to be very mindful of the, to verify if the, the automations work okay. They might get tricky sometimes. So yes, you you want to have that as smoothly as possible too. But yeah, that can be a challenge sometimes. So it's it, what I hear is that there's, it's a lot about the technology a bit between between those bits, you need to have create some yes, uh, automation to. or some feeds which have to be a bit customized each time because it's depending on your needs, right? Exactly, yes. And, and that would yeah. probably fall outside the business teams uh, area that would need proper IT um, support. Okay, so first thing is obviously the the IT, uh, the 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 importance of the, of the IT getting the IT teams involved. Now, if we look at the the PIM itself, how would you um, like what in your eyes are the main benefits of of, of PIM uh, for you and your daily work? Well, to be honest, I don't imagine a world with, of a big company without having a PIM. Um, first, because it makes the curve of learning curve for any new user of the company shorter. You have all, uh, one place to go to t- that has the source of truth for every user, which is good. Otherwise, it forces new, I mean, old users and new users, but it can be even more disturbing for new users to go to different sources or different, uh, you know, different sources along the, the company. Um, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's easier first, it's faster, and then proper pins have transformation capabilities. So the possibility of using the information as it is stored and modifying it with business rules to the expectation of the touch point. So this is, sounds a little bit geek, but you know, in, to make it come into real life, um, the categorization of the product, and we might categorize a product as a doll, which is you know we work in toy industry, so we have all our Barbies in dolls. But maybe dolls is not the exact categorization that Amazon or Target or you know the multiple retailers that we have in the region would accept. Maybe they want that to be called dolls and accessories. So it's just a very simple rules to transform one value into the other once we know what the expectations are. Or renaming images following a specific business rule as using the, the retailer ID code, stuff like that, which can be countless hours of manual work, can be resolved very fast with a proper team. And um, so on, on that part, I, I hear also there's an element of if you want to do changes for a vast amount, like a vast size of catalog, is there a point where you say, okay, what kind of size of catalogs at what point does it make sense to have a PIM? Is there a limit in your mind or not really? What? Well, I would say, and you know, I mean, I I guess every company has its sweet spot between the level of investment in technology and the level of complexity that they need to look after. But I would say, if you're looking at a catalog that is above 200 references, if you're, you know, the if the percentage of newness of the catalog year to year is, you know, over 30 percent, if you're looking after multiple languages or multiple retailers. Um, all that are good signals that you might want to have everything in one place and with transformation rules in place. Okay, um, that that makes sense. Do you have other examples of like things which can be automated or which you find are crucial in uh, on on the PIM? You talked about okay, maybe some uh, attributes or categories need to be changed for all, like a big number of SKUs in one time. Are, are there other things of, or automations you, uh, you yes. have in mind, which makes a lot of sense? That's a very good question. And I would pull out probably two more use cases. One is around 
having the possibility to offer open catalogs, self-service catalogs for different touch points, like you might not have the bandwidth to service each retailer or each uh, wholesaler or whatever in your region, but you might have the bandwidth to create one open catalog from which any of them can connect and download their own, their own information that is always synchronized to, to your BIM um, instance. So that's a very powerful tool. And I would also call out the power of workflows. So, work, I mean, some of the people of the audience might or might not be uh, uh, familiar with what a workflow looks like, but it's, I, I would say that material for workflows, good, good material for workflows are stuff that happen at high volumes, processes that happen at high volumes that might need a sequence, you know, step one performed before step two, you know, and then step three. So that can that, that always happen in the same sequence and that the causes or outcomes can be predicted with, you know, a fair degree of, of certainty. It's not a good, um, you know, if, if you have proper processes that look like that, you know, whenever a product becomes available, then you need to create a maze, then you need to, uh, things that look like that, then workflows is something that you might be interested in looking into because it saves a lot of manual effort. And also it makes the detection of some critical events come fast because it's a machine working for you as opposite of somebody looking into multiple spreadsheets or whatever. And Those two were massive breakthroughs. And I feel like I totally agree with the workflow part is the one which is super interesting, but it it seems sometimes that it's it, it doesn't go through to really making being put in place in in some cases. Do you have examples of workflows you've seen really work very well without giving any secret recipe? But it's like although it's the title of the uh, webinar, but like things you've you 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 you've seen work very well, and you would recommend other other brands uh, using. Well. I mean, the one that worked really worked for us, but again, it's a very material centric um, thing, is the is detecting that we have the, the right materials in place. So the image assets and the translated copies to execute feature callout images. So images that have text in it, they need to be localized. Uh, like if they have a little text in English, in order to implement it in French retailers, we need to translate the text and re-render the JPEGs. So of course, with more than 300 items that have these um, kind of images times eight languages that we look after, it becomes a significant amount of, you know, of cases to, to do. And the governance of the process itself can be tricky. Okay, for which items do I already have the images for? For which items do I already have the copy translated for? So all that is what we put together into a workflow to let us know when the materials are ready, instruct the, um, the designers to re-render the JPEGs and then re-upload it into the, into the dam. And then, you know, then triggering more instructions once that the images reach our Salsify instance again, the translated images, if that makes sense, mm. reach our Salsify instance again. So again, it is a very much a centric way because that's the way that we receive the information. But I would probably say that as long as you know your own processes, so you know your business processes, and you start developing some sensitivity around creating instructions. So, you know, it's a little bit about learning the language of business and learning the language of IT at the same time. That creates a very powerful advantage or a very powerful tool. Yeah. And uh i feel a lot of like anything around translations there will be like a third party be it you know an agency a translation partner or even internal teams there's always a third party which will be involved and and check in making sure that you know the proper people are tagged or pinged when when the task is is uploaded and and stuff like that i think that's very uh relevant to uh any brand do you have any other uh workflows you've you've seen uh uh, maybe out uh, or specific or a bit different, which uh, you think makes sense. Is there 
like I know sometimes you can have validation rules like uh, where you, uh, you you sort of force in the system that, OK, this field has to be 70 characters long or whatever for titles. Have you have you been using that, which is not really a workflow, but a, like another that's a way gover- of Yes, that's a kind of governance, a governance one. Uh, we have not used it. I mean, personally, I have not. But I also think because that fortunately we receive it from upstream systems already. Uh, in a compliant way, uh, but yes, they can be very useful if, if, I mean, for companies that need to perform that. So my team doesn't have doesn't have that particular challenge, but I can see other contexts that this would be a very relevant use case. Or also, um, if there's a piece of critical information that is missing, um, and all the rest is ready to syndicate, it might trigger a workflow for a particular team to complete. For instance, if you have, I don't know, all the content ready, but you don't have the cost of the product to push it to the retailer, you might, you know, create a workflow for the sales team or something, stuff like that. That would also be helpful. Okay. Uh, I think that uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, In terms of... uh, go like on on those uh, workflows and and looking taking a step back also is Mattel is obviously in every countries and you've probably got a regional organization and and a global organization how uh, could you give a bit of perspective on the on the different countries and for the people who are listening who could be also in a in a large organization with a lot of different countries how do you feel uh, how is what are the the good things of having a PIM and and sometimes the limitations because I it's it's not very easy to have a lot of uh, stakeholders potentially come in and and maybe you know touch the, the content and then you know and that there's all that you know making sure it's compliant making sure that everyone is is using the right content and not tempering with it so what 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 are the benefits and and a bit the threats or challenges from your point of view That's a super good question. So every company will have to find its sweet spot again. You know, it's themes are not a product that you just bring out of a shelf and you consume it right away. You you need to tweak it to your organization. And that's why it's good to have a flexible tool. Um, There has to be a balance between the, the group of people in the organization that can actually do stuff with the tool. You know, when I say do, it's not be, being a consumer, but also being a um, having a seat at the table to for the business modeling, the, this kind of decisions, and the, um, also being ruthless enough with the governance rules because otherwise it can get out of control. So the way that we tackle this in, in Madel is that we have. I would say a nice and small, but very proficient group of people knowing the tool, like four or five people in Europe knowing the tool and with constant uh, contact with our US counterparts that are also in the same position as we are. And then we foster adoptions to the other teams like marketing teams or sales teams. And I would say that we, the way that we do it is we grant first a very basic um, role. A very basic role can only read stuff and touch nothing. <laughs> so, and once they get proper training and they, you know, uh, they pass the, the, the official certifications or, or they demonstrate that there is enough proficiency in the tool, we might upgrade them into having more superpowers into, into it. But I do think it's a good idea, as you mentioned, to be be aware of not, people not tempering with content happily because it can yeah it can produce gaps otherwise. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is that you're being cautious about, especially in such a large organization as yours, to going at least step by step and and keeping a, a good decent level of of control. A lot of organization are based on on the country specific when it comes to e-commerce, right? Because they they will have because e-commerce will belong to the sales teams and or and and then the media team also. Uh the content is sometimes also pretty local. Do you see a switch of organization go more to a 
regional organization because you're you're heading a regional organization about uh, e-retail content. What what do you think? Do you see a, a move towards that? What, what do you think are the pros and cons of of these uh, two like multi countries or pan European? What, what's your approach? Knowing Amazon is getting more and more pan European, for example. So for us, it's a clear direction into. I mean, into not duplicating efforts. You know, for it's the like kind of the first rule of efficiency: try not to duplicate the same efforts that the same that your colleagues are doing. So, as much as we can leverage from one centralized material creation point of view, the better. Um, it also, of course, means that sometimes it can get be tricky to become very local on on one particular asset. But we are happy to pay that cost, if it makes sense. Okay, so it's this. It's if I understand well, it's still focusing a lot on the on the on the larger regional level rather than uh, yes. on every having duplicating that. Uh, yes, we and, don't create the content locally. I mean, we we transcreate, of course, the source language, but we don't create locally. And are the local and uh, tell me if, if I'm if this is too uh, being too precise, but is are the local teams getting involved in in the creation in their own languages, or this all under your team and you're handling that? Uh, with minimal intervention, I would say local teams. Okay. Okay. So, um, and it's yeah, life is not you, perfect, so we cannot remove it completely off their shoulders, but uh, yeah, we try to minimize it. Yeah, and what's the approach? Because sometimes you could feel in some organization that uh, local teams might have a feeling that you know people are taking away uh, the, their work, or that the, the global team will not know the specificities of of you know French, Polish, whatever the, the local language. How, how does that? How is your organization reacting to the fact of saying, okay, actually this is a workload which is removed from them? Is that is that working well, or is that you feel they sometimes some um, um, like uh, tensions, let's say. No, we haven't sensed tension in that er in that arena. Maybe okay. I'm too, I am too, I mean, maybe my predecessor faced it, <laughs> but the way that uh, since I got the role, I don't feel that there is any tension around um, about that. Probably because our teams are also not that large. So if the marketing lead would have to dedicate his or her time into creating the specific e-commerce content, it would be overwhelming. Okay, and which which I understand. But one of the things I wanted to touch on there is like there is an element of governance and an, an element of organization, right, and maturity of the organization when you're entering into a PIM because it's also about changing habits, uh, organization, organizing stuff, changing the ways you've been doing it for, for time. Do you, do you have uh, or some experience in the in in, in Mattel or or in, in your in your business life of of this change? How how difficult is it? And do you have any tips about you know how to make that sort of change happen in in an organization from what you've seen? So I, I have not personally led such changes. Uh, I mean, that such that changed the whole team. Um, but I, but I bred on this topic. So I'd probably say it's about having the right people sitting on the table, on, on the planning table, making sure that you capture areas of the business that you might not necessarily be familiar with. As, and they will have a butterfly effect, you know, some things that you change over here might have a, an unexpected change, I mean, unexpected to yourself because you're not familiar to it in other areas of the business. So I would say you need to have a diverse group within the implementation team. That would be my recommendation. Okay. And, mm -hmm. some, and make sure that these people that they will be... Um, Efficient, and I mean, they will like technology. They will be, you know, willing to test stuff, willing to do that, willing to learn that, you know, to bridge the the probably language gap between IT and business, but also with the ambition to change organization, you know, to so, to socialize the tool, to bring up 
the advantages of moving into a new tool to bring up the use cases to well to evangelize around the tool. We need to have that, that kind of profiles within the teams that do the implementation. Yeah, because end of end of the day, the adoption is a bit the the the, the tricky part, right? To for any tool uh, yes. and for any adoption organization, a small one like ours or, or very very large ones like Metal. And how do you uh, how do you address that a bit um, adoption? Like you you gave some hints about okay, evangelizing, uh, making examples. Of, like how how do you uh, feel that is going? Is that still a, a, an everyday challenge or what was your experience over that? So even though we've had our team for over four years, I would say probably in the last year and a half, we have a massive increase of users for the tool in the region. And I would say it comes hand in hand to being resilient in explaining stuff once and over and over again, because you know it's for, for the first for the per- people that hear on a topic for the first time, they will probably not grab all of it as you know as if you explain it to somebody who's working on one topic every single day of their lives. So you need to be patient. You need to show the advantages. Um, and we've had a lot of satisfying experiences with sales teams in the area. When we showed them, you know, this takes you like three hours to do it without a tool. Let's do it with the tool. It takes you 15 minutes. You know, yeah. yes, you will have to go through the learning curve, but you know, this this thing you do it, you know, five, six times a year, it's worth the effort. So there's a resistance always to learning new stuff. That's normal. We're human. But if you show the benefits, you know, you need to concentrate the benefits and that makes it a sexier message. And I know you mentioned when we t- talked uh, in preparation that the fact of bringing the different people to the table, uh, like e-commerce is a great, I find it, it, ha- it brings people to speak together, like sales, uh, retail media, but also now IT and, and like content people, right? It's, it's, it, it pushes that because PIM is, is to be used by at uh, different stages by a lot of people, right? It is. You're right. That's that. That's right. It's a way to. It's a very good way to define it. It creates. It takes a village to raise a kid, and it takes a village to syndicate content. <laughs> exactly, and it's funny because uh, I was in uh, on the Prosper show about talking about Amazon and and talk, we're talking with Amazon advertising, and we're saying the first thing to to build success. So obviously, you have logistics to set up to make sure you can deliver products. That's for sure. But this, the, the very first thing after that is really content and make sure that you have good content to speak to, to consumers. So sales will not happen. Retail media will not be efficient if the content piece is not really working very well. So it has, it pushes uh, that part. I have a question around that because sometimes uh, IT teams have got loads of different projects and you could have D2C project, you could have logistics projects, the supply chain, lots of things. How is it, how do you feel that, you know, I modern IT teams are, are getting into this thing about talking about content and having those tools and making those uh, connections with the different systems? What was your experience on that? Would, you know, do you feel it's it's going well? It's still taking time. Um... So in in our experience, um, it's not IT teams looking after content itself. So we have a group of a team that looks after you know proper copywriting, assets creation, that kind of stuff. Then we have IT team that makes sure that this flows from one system to another. <laughs> And we have business teams such as my own and also the, the counterparts in the other regions that we try to be kind of in the middle. So we are not we are not as proficient with IT as IT teams. We are not as creative as the creative team, but we try to interpret it both languages and also to introduce the concept of content optimization to try to to test what works better and to input the way that the studios that the you know the the artistic teams would develop the the content for the next season. So if I put it in my own words, you have your team as at the 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 like um uh the crossroads i was looking for the word i had carrefour in french but it doesn't work <laughs> at the crosswords of of crossroads of of different teams and you so would you say that 
it, it's a key to success to have those people making sure that the difference between the creatives, the sales, the IT, all those people uh, connect together through and with the same goal because a PIM will not do exactly what everyone wants. It will do it the way it does it, right? So mm-hmm. is that is that a big work of yours is to do diplomacy <laughs> in a sense? Or? Well, it's not really diplomacy. It's about, you know, transforming data into insights. It's about sharing it in the right way. Um, so I would say that the world cannot work in silos, neither for this role or for any other. Uh, you need to partner with, the, with your colleagues um, to join the, the different perspectives of the business in one table if you want the organization to move faster. I mean, I'm not discovering anything new, but if you work in silos, you probably work slower. Mm. And and I I find it very interesting that especially working with with Amazon, but to be fair, anything in in e-commerce, it sort of breaks a lot of silos, which were very well organized for years in, in large companies, and they have to reinvent themselves all the time to address those uh, those things about um, like making sure you're successful in in e-commerce. So we'll start to open to questions. So if people have questions, please do put them in in the Q&A section. I have one uh, uh, for you, Lorena, is about, um, there's a lot of uh, PIM tools in the market. So obviously uh, we're a Salsify partner and we've been working together on that Salsify part. So we'll be talking about Salsify, but there's, there's other tools. How would you, what would be your recommendations for any company looking to uh, to work on their, their PIM? There's different levels of PIM, right? You have very wide PIMs, you have simple PIMs only to do syndication. What how what would be your tips basically on that on that part? I'd probably say, you know, spend more time thinking of the problem than thinking of the solution. So make the understand what your business challenges are where you you know what are the painful areas what you know where you spend most time what causes the more churn and then look for the tool that satisfies that you know probably you need to partner with your procurement team or something like that to or or to call the the players and ask them for a pitch but you need to think of your challenges first rather than buying a solution and expect them to fix it Unfortunately, it's not a recipe for, I mean, or, or, or not a recipe that I know of, at least, uh, that uh, would help. And um, one of the questions I was uh, talking earlier was a member of our team who's looking after partnerships. And we were talking about the fact that there's multiple tools. When, when you're looking at the process, you've got content, you've got retail media, obviously. But if you get closer to content, you've got order management uh, you've got potentially, you know, pricing mechanism things like how, what, what's your, you, you're obviously focused on, on the content side, but like, how do you feel if you take a step back about all those different tools and all, all those different bricks? Obviously, it's super relevant when you're D2C. When you're B2B2C, it's less less relevant. But there's, I feel there's so many tools now which are appearing and with a lot of, uh, competitors in each sectors, uh, like in PIMs, in DAMs, in ERPs, in in um, like uh, order management and stuff like that. W- what's your approach uh, on that? You think that companies will have to have you know those different tools because DTC will become a, a must probably at some point. W- what's your approach on that? Uh, yeah, Which I is mean, a wide question. <laughs> it's a wide question indeed. Um, probably the answer is I would offer kind of the same answer that I you, that I offered you before. You need to you can you cannot expect the road a roadmap to be finalized from one day to another. You probably need to to think okay to do an overarching strategy of where you want to finally reach, and and then to break it down into what you want to solve first and what you want to, what you can postpone and solve, solve later on. Um, this is a, it moves fast. The, the, there are multiple options all the time. Uh, it, there will be even more multiple options within a year or two, or and even more with three. So you cannot expect to hit perfection on the first attempt, probably. So I would say focus on the you know on the stuff that you really need to solve on on your watch during that year try to have it fixed learn along the way if it's not the perfect solution you will have to iterate but 
that's, I mean, I, I don't have a perfect answer for that one. <laughs> yeah. And or hire a, a good consultancy well, company such as yours. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. But and to, to that point, it's like, do you, is there any like technology or tools uh, kind of team? Because even for us, it's like keeping up to date with all the different tools, which is which are in the market is becoming a like a nearly a full time job. Do you feel like in, in procurement or, or in, in, in the IT teams? I don't know. Is there uh, where do you feel in Mattel or in other bigger companies, uh, comp like teams which are starting to say, okay, we need to have a, the, the thinking about technology as a whole into, into a whole process? Is, do you see that yet or not really? I'm starting to see that in Mattel as well. Like okay. having a team dedicated to marketing transformation. Which is yeah, which is digital transformation uh, in in general, and but to I feel in e-commerce is it's getting a bit overwhelming because you get tools every day in the market for multiple uh, multiple uh, things happening. Um, one of the, we didn't talk about much about the last part, the syndication part. Um, like PIMS, generally speaking, when they when they sort of pitch, it's they are solving two type of issues. One is the single source of truth, which you were talking about is like having one place where you've got all, all your data. And the second one is really syndicating. So pushing content uh, everywhere. Um, now the market here is also fragmented. There's a lot of suppliers offering syndicating, some syndication, some can syndicate everywhere, some less, some, what's your, what, do you have an approach or a belief on that? And we've that's a lot of discussions we've had in the past also, but uh, like how you, because there's so many retailers with themselves, different technologies, uh, your technology doesn't, adapt, like not always your PIM, so could be Salsify, doesn't adapt everywhere. How do you feel uh, things are going? You, you, do you feel it should be a hybrid thing where you have partially it's automated and partially it's manual? How do you feel the things are going to go on that end? I mean, short, middle term, I, yeah, there will always be a part that is manual because you cannot expect to have an API connection to every single retailer in the fragmented uh, landscape of Europe. So yeah, I would say that that's still to happen for a few number of years. Mm. And you were talking about site, what, what um, Salsify called sites and experiences, which is like digital catalogs, do you see some retailers accepting, saying, "Okay, uh, I'll I'll go and uh, and I'll take the data from there"? Or is that I feel that sometimes it's a bit difficult to get them to do that work, and they expect the brands to upload a bit on the Amazon time. Well, in fact, uploading into into the CMS of a retailer, it's quite of a unique case of Amazon, the rest of the retailers, you need to send it over to them and they would they do it. Yeah. Yes, they do it themselves. They don't give access to a CMS. Um, whether they pull it down from a catalog or they want a WeTransfer document, that yeah remains a conversation. But even if they would only accept you know, a, a SharePoint or something like that, it's still easier to pull it out from a from a one single source of truth than to attempt it to fill it from multiple um, you know, systems. So yeah, I would still think it's a good idea to have a piece. And um, maybe as a as a, a bit of a wrapping up uh, part is like from the the different experiences uh, and implementing the PIMs and having uh, this all this syndication partially automated, partially manual. What are the main learnings for you, which we could share about, you know, what what really goes well and what didn't go well, and and maybe we could be mindful about in in the stuff which you know, is great and less great, let's say. So, I would say that one of the difficult pieces around decide about automation is deciding what to automate. Ultimately, probably everything can be automated, but it. It comes as at the cost as well, either dollar cost or you know internal teams bandwidth cost. It comes as, a, but always it's. I mean, there's no free lunch. So, one of the things that we had to learn along the way is how to promote 
the adoption and the benefits of the tool and at the same time say no to some potential initiatives because the critical mass, the size of the price was not that large. So we had to be proficient in assessing which projects of automation made it to the to-do list or to the backlog and which will, won't and will never make it because you know they, the automation just would not out, you know, they would not be advantageous, advantageous enough to the organization. So it, that that I find super interesting is like sometimes automation look great on the paper, but if you go into it, you actually lose a lot of time for an outcome which is not so great. Is that is that a bit what you? Yeah, it's it's that. It's also you know the how many SKUs do you have to syndicate to that particular retailer? How long does it take to you know to fill the template? Some templates are pretty easy to fill. Some templates are pretty complicated to fill. Uh, which is the revenue that comes from it. Um, all, all those questions, you, you need to make sure to ask them. Otherwise, you will end up with an infinite to-do list of uh, you know, channel creations or whatever that, well, that you need to choose your battles. Okay, makes a lot of sense of making, yeah, picking the battles and uh, like technology is, is great, but it can be... <laughs> Uh, uh, like uh, you can be like the gerbil running in your mm. little wheel and not not looking out of what, why why you're doing it. Thank you so much, Lorena. It was great uh, having you today talking about you know how to uh, make the most of of your uh, PIM uh, system. I have a question before I, I I leave you. Sorry, I didn't see it. Um, how and where did you manage a different differentiation? between the content for your brand sites, D2C, and the one adapted and shared with retailers? So different copies say, of the same? No, I would say 99% of it, except, you know, very uh, singular attributes such as the product title are consistent between the retailers and D2C environments. So, but on the ones which have got specificities, do you create uh, specific attributes, which is only for one, one type of retailer, let's say uh, Amazon, Amazon title. <laughs> we, yes. We know them. Okay. Yes, but we don't have only Amazon. Yes, we, we have yeah. that, but we have some others <laughs> as well. And yeah, we create specific attributes for that. But I would say we try to minimize that as much as possible, because again, you know, content, adaptation by retailer it's also a very um well resource consuming activity okay yeah i agree and to to that point like having a global slash regional data modeling it's it also means that sometimes you might miss some specificities of local markets mm -hmm. uh and like if we keep say on the simple Amazon uh, example, like Amazon US and Amazon Europe would would probably have diff sometimes different attributes. Is that, how do you handle that sort of specific uh, country um, uh, like needs? Do you manage to make sure everything is is polished on, on that part or is it sometimes it's manual uh, process locally? Is it a bit of both? So, so, yeah, a bit of both, depending on the particular challenge. So if it comes to trying to make our content more SEO optimized, um, so yeah, we have some local intervention on that. If it comes to be, I don't know, specific attribute that is requested in one area, not another one, well, we try to, well, we, depending on how mandatory it is, on, we also have a roadmap of attributes that we will incorporate into the beam. Um, yeah, we, we we cross the bridges when we face them. Uh, but and, again, it's also about choosing the battles. Yeah, and, and like you said, it's about, okay, sometimes maybe there's a bit of manual work, but versus the amount of work which uh, was would be needed to like achieve something or some automation or adding or changing the data model, it's always looking at what makes sense. I think it's it's uh, it's interesting, and it's then for every brand to look at it and balance uh, those different things. I think uh, we don't have any other questions, so I can re say uh, thank you, Lorena, and uh, it was a great great having you today. If anyone has got uh, questions, you can reach out to us on on LinkedIn. Uh, it was great having you. I think I have a, 
a thank you page yes and you even have uh, emails and stuff to get in touch with us so thank you very much everyone have a great end of day and see you very soon thanks Lorena thank you thank you for having me have a nice rest of the day thanks bye